statement, the statement of the early church writers is that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Every time a, a, a martyr was killed and planted into the ground, it seemed that ten would rise up in his place. And so you couldn't kill Christians and succeed at compromising them. And so what Constantine said is, hey, I don't have a problem with it. You can't beat them. Join them. And so he had this conversion. If you read and study any at all on Constantine's conversion, he was just as lost after he saw a cross in the sky as he was before he, uh, before he saw that and had his vision. I believe, and uh, I don't believe that he had a vision at all. If he did, it was a satanic vision. But I don't believe Constantine ever received Christ as his Savior. He simply did join the church or actually merge the church in the Roman Empire because it was politically expedient. In AD 312, he said, it's legal. He issued the Edict of Milan, which said it's legal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. You can't be killed for it. And then in AD 313, he declared that Rome was now a Christian nation, and he required all his soldiers to be baptized into the church. He required everybody in the Roman Empire to become part of the church. And, of course, we know that Rome was known uh, for throughout the world, and the Roman Empire was known for universalism and for paganism and for multiplicity of gods. Matter of fact, the thing they hated about Christians was the one God. The thing they hated about Jews was one God. And so what happened when Constantine issued the Edict of Milan? Well, the Roman Catholic Church got started. That's what happened. That's when Diana, who was a goddess of fertility, became Mary. That's when the different gods became the apostles and the saints. And that's why the Roman Catholic Church today worships saints. They're not worshiping the saints that the names represent. They're worshiping the gods that are behind those saints. I have some books that trace the origin of those saints and document those things. From, uh, uh, one of those would be by uh, a gentleman by the name of Hislop, and it traces all the way back from the beginnings of the gods, even, even in Babylon, all the way down the worship of these different gods and into the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, and I don't apologize for this statement at all, Roman Catholic Church has never been comprised with believers. It has been a political church for the purpose of conquering the world. It has been an organization that is used for conquering. And, of course, Constantine was using the church politically. And so Constantine, of course, had his... Uh, his, what do you call it, his capital city, Constantinople. And when he became a Christian and made, uh, made the Roman Empire Christian, he decided that at Constantinople he needed some manuscripts that would, rep, would uh, be for the church. Now let me ask you a question. A man like Constantine, what kind of Bible do you think he'd want? Do you think he'd want an allegorical scripture? Or do you think he'd want a literal copy of the scripture? Do you think he'd want a scripture that was free from doctrinal error that taught that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me? Or do you think he'd want a Bible that would say, well, God's the Father of all living, and everybody's going to go to heaven eventually, even the devil? I don't think I have to answer that question. Constantine was an unbeliever, and he sought out those individuals which would have been into higher rationalism, uh, the individuals at, at Alexandria, and that would have been the brand of Christianity that Constantine embraced. And so he sent an order to Eusebius, who was, uh, was in Alexandria. Here's an order for 50 manuscripts. AD 331, the emperor Constantine ordered Eusebius, who now moved to Caesarea in Palestine, to provide 50 manuscripts for the churches, in of Constantinople. Uh, this isn't the book I was hoping to look up because it, it actually gave the quote of the things that he was looking for. Constantine funded it. He provided the scholarship for it. He provided the vellum and the text type. And uh, if you look at, if you study today the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, those texts are of very, very high quality. Uh, something like the emperor would have the funds to provide for the copy of the text. Let me ask you a question. What would be the characteristic of the Christians in the first and second century with regard to finances and textual or, and uh, material ability for copying the scripture? They were poor as dirt. And they would use whatever was available to them. They wouldn't have used high quality uh, textual material, which one explains why there are not a lot of early texts. They just didn't survive because of the materials that were used. And secondly, they didn't survive because of the usage. The Bible has always been used a lot by believers, and it's very little used by unbelievers. And so, anyway, there's an individual uh, by the name of Tischendorf. I think we'll get to look at him briefly here in a little bit. But um, he believes that the Sinaiticus is one of these copies that Constantine ordered to be made for the church at Constantinople. And so the conclusion about this foundation of the Alexandrian text would be that it's not proved that there, well, a conclusion about the, the, this text
text in particular. It's not proved that they're exact copies that Constantine ordered from this heretic, speaking of Eusebius, but it's certain that they were derived from the same source. Let me conclude a couple of things that we've just said about these Alexandrian texts. First of all, the individual who would have been responsible for the text that these would have come from would have been Oregon. And he had some major doctrinal error, and he had no qualms about admitting that he altered the scripture in order to correct it doctrinally to what he believed. Didn't apologize for that, didn't deny it. He believed that he had the authority to correct the scripture. And these texts came from his texts. And so, in the second century, do you think that believing people would have recognized the text from Alexandria as legitimate and as accurate? The answer is no, the church is always rejected. And you can read the early church fathers and how that they fought against Oregon and they fought against Arianism and they fought against Gnosticism. And these were uh, arguments and things that were in the first and second century established in the councils. And so what I want to remind you about this morning is that these were texts that in the century in which they were written were rejected by believers. And I don't apologize for making a statement such as that the true church has always been comprised with believers. The true church is not a church which is organized by Constantine. The true church is comprised with people that have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so the Roman Catholic Church has never been a legitimate church. Its doctrine's never been legitimate. It's never been uh, legitimized. Our believers have never recognized it. And believers have never been a part of it. You say, Pastor, I believe there are saved people in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, God knows all about that, but you don't, and neither do I. The fact is the Roman Catholic Church teaches heretical doctrine and always has from its foundation, which is when, Roman, or when, when uh, Christianity was declared to be the religion of the Roman Empire. And believers have never been a part of that institution throughout the history of the church, and that's traceable. Well, here is kind of a look at what we've seen before, and that is the three families of the text. There would be the traditional text, the Byzantine text, the majority text. Something I want to point out to you is that the oldest uh, complete copies of the Scripture would be in, over in the left-hand category, and that they would be the Alexandrian text. And why do you think the reason for that would be? Well, they weren't used, and two, they were full of doctrinal error, and so the church rejected them, and that's why they existed. They were not used. Um, Let's look at the history of the Alexandrian text. Just a couple of things that I think will help us. First of all, the Alexandrian text, their origination, they came from Egypt and North Africa. Uh, they were shorter than the traditional text. Tell me the reason that the Alexandrian text were shorter than the TR, the traditional text, the one we use. In other words, why are the last verses of Mark left out? Why is uh, the Yohanan comma left out? Why, why would they be shorter? Let me tell me, we just covered it a minute ago. Because they're against the deity of Christ. Yeah, because Oregon took those verses out. We know when they were taken out. They know why they were taken out. And today we say, well, the better texts don't have them. My friend, the worst texts don't have them. The first century church recognized that those verses belonged in the Scripture. And if you'll read the church fathers long before Oregon began his doctrinal heresy, those verses of the Scripture were established as belonging in the Scripture. Um, all English translations except the King James Version and New King James Version are out of the two texts, primarily the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, and the family of texts that would, would come from those texts or support those texts. By the way, uh, well, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I won't make that statement. Uh, these would be called today, the text that would be compiled from those would be the eclectic or the critical text. Um, West Cotton Hort in 1881 compiled these into a into what he believed would he took the text and reconciled them with each other and made what he believed would be the most accurate copy of the scripture today. Uh, the NIV, the NASV, the RSV, and all modern versions except for the King James version come from these texts. Now, more accurately, this statement could say the New King James version. The New King James version. The problem with that copy of the scripture is that it rejects the text of the Old Testament that have been historically embraced by Christianity. And so you say, Pastor, what about the New King James Version of the Scripture? Well, the New Testament's better than all the rest of the modern translations, but the problem with it is that the philosophy behind it is the same philosophy behind these texts. The idea of the New King James Version behind the uh, making that version of the Scripture was these crazy people won't ever let loose of their King James Bible, and so we'll just kind of make one similar to theirs so they'll accept it. Again, it's a money-making thing. 
and I just don't, 